These next two are uh, crucial because what I really wanted to do is to, as much as possible, get into the house of the Prophet ﷺ and really understand the dynamics of that household and how things are forming, especially in the early days of Islam. And so, as I was putting together all of these notes and getting into these small narrations where you often get these snapshots into the lives, and you know, someone asked last week, a very important question, where when Ali is talking about being in the household of the Prophet ﷺ and being the only one to sort of witness the Qiyam, witness the night prayer of um, the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija radiallahu anha, where is Zayd, where are the other children, what's happening here, and Allah knows best. We, we can only take what we can take from the narrations themselves. Of course, the way that families were raised back then, where kids were sleeping, aunts, uncles, it's a village type feel, right? Allah knows best. But uh, hopefully what we can do through the series is start to, inshallah, take these isolated snapshots and then go one by one and start to see the trajectory through the eyes of that person that enters very early in into this, this story, this magnificent story of the Prophet And then through that, to be very honest with you, um, you're not just gaining an appreciation for each one of these sabiqun, each one of these firsts. But really, each and every single one of these stories makes you fall in love with the Prophet all over again. Because one of the things that fascinates me is how he was able to make all of these people feel so special. <laughs> you know, when you read the biographies of the companions, sometimes you really think like this person is the most important person in the story. And then you read the next story. And that's the ability of the Prophet ﷺ to treat his family and his companions in a certain way that he wasn't just ignoring, you know, ignoring them and then focusing on this person here and this person there. However, um, the actual family of the Prophet ﷺ, if he treated his companions this way, imagine what it was like to actually be his blood. Imagine what it was like to actually be in his household and to be treated in a certain way. And so each one of these is going to give us a different perspective, but these next two in particular, really building off of last week's where we talked about Ali, uh, Allah Ta'ala Anhu will, will give us a very special look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and at the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at this family uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So before we get into the marriage of Ali and Fatima, quick recap of Ali Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu and then let's bring Fatima Radiallahu Anha into the story and then talk about these two coming together. So with, with Ali, we said his mother's name was what? We're going to test y'all's knowledge. Fatima. So we said there were a lot of Fatimas, right? There were a lot of Hinds and there were a lot of Fatimas. Those are the two names that you constantly see popping up. A lot of people named Hind, a lot of people named Fatima. So Fatima bint what? What is his mother's full name? Fatima bint Asad. And the way you can remember that is that we said she wanted to, she actually named him first Asad after her father, which means lion, okay? Fatima bint Asad. And we said that she was the first what? She was a first herself. Does anyone remember? The first, not Qurayshi Muslim, the first Hashimi woman to accept Islam. Hashim was the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Banu Hashim. So she was the first woman who was a Hashimite from the actual family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, from his tribe to accept Islam, and we said that she was about the 11th person, the 10th or the 11th person uh, to enter into Islam when you look into the order. Uh, also another mother-like figure to the Prophet ﷺ, right? There's Umm Ayman, and then there's Fatima bint Asad, who raises the Prophet ﷺ as a motherly figure from the age of six to 25, uh, accepted Islam very early on, made the migration to Abyssinia, lived through the boycott, made the migration to Medina, went through all the hardships alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Ali was born about, as we said, 10 years before prophethood. So about the year 600, exactly between 600, 602, he was uh, born and he supports the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right away. We talked about how the Prophet, peace be upon him, brought Ali radiallahu anhu into the house. He told his uncle Al-Abbas, let's go to Abu Talib and help him out with his poverty. So let's, t let's take two of his children and raise them ourselves so that Abu Talib could deal with the poverty in his household. The Messenger of Allah goes with Al-Abbas. The Prophet walks up to Ali and grabs him. 
Al-Abbas walks up to Ja'far and he takes him and both of them would raise those two until they reached their adulthood. And we also said that one of the miracles is that Khadija did not breastfeed Ali, uh, which, would have made her, which would have made him haram for Fatima, which would have made him like a son, effectively a son to Khadija, had she breastfed him. But for, for whatever reason, it's the, uh, the, the mercy of Allah to Ali radiallahu anhu and the wisdom of Allah and how that would play out. She never actually fed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, though he was of that age and though it was natural for a child to be fed uh, by a, a mother that, that, that had flowing milk um, in those days. So that's Ali radiallahu anhu. He comes into the house, as we said, accepts Islam right away. And that sight of the Prophet وسلم, Khadija and Ali praying in front of the Kaaba, praying Qiyam all alone. There was something there. Now, let's talk about Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha and how she comes into. And her nickname, Al-Habibatu, bint Al-Habib, the beloved one, the daughter of the beloved one, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, may Allah be pleased with her and send his peace and blessings upon her father and her mother. She was born, according to most historians, she was actually born in the first year of prophethood. Okay, so according to um, many, of the, many of the scholars like Ibn Abd al-Barr al-Hakim, um, Ibn Hajar, she was born the year that the Prophet ﷺ received revelation. So think about her birth, which would mean, you know, that when Khadija radiallahu anha was running up and down Hira to help the Prophet ﷺ going through that stress, she could have been pregnant with her sixth child or fifth or sixth child because there's dispute about whether Abdullah is older or younger than Fatima or she would have been an infant. So according to some, she was born either right before prophethood, so she was literally a baby when the Prophet ﷺ received revelation or she was born right after the Prophet ﷺ received revelation in that very first year. So that's a special child. <laughs> Right, just the circumstances of her birth to come in during that time period of the Prophet Sallallahu life where he just received revelation. Um, and this is a, a gift that Allah gives to them, is special in and of itself. So she was the last of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daughters. Um, and I mentioned, I believe, a narration in, when we were talking about Khadija radiallahu anha that the way that the naming worked was how? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi named the boys Khadija named the girls. And so Khadija named her Fatima. Who can guess why? Because guess what Khadija's mom's name was? Fatima. <laughs> so her mother was Fatima bin Zaida. So Khadija named her uh, after her mother, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the word Fatima has an interesting meaning to it. So we said Khadija means what? I'm going to keep on quizzing you guys on the past halaqa so you can get it in inshallah. He said Khadija means what? Does anyone remember what the name Khadija means? See, Wanda is going through her notes. <laughs> Where are you guys at? Where's everyone? <laughs> premature. Khadija means premature. So, and it's a very, there's no one else named Khadija. All right, so the indication is that she was born very early for her to be given the name Khadija, premature. Fatima, comes from the, 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 the term Fatim, which is a baby that is full term and weaned. <laughs> it's like the opposite, it's really interesting. Khadija is premature, Fatima is full term and weaned. Um, and you know, it's really, you know, so, so some of the scholars or some of, and really you're not really looking at Islamic scholars here, you're looking at, I was reading what some of the scholars of language said. They said that it could be that the Arabs used this name to indicate a very healthy girl, that a girl was healthy, full, obviously, or you're naming after another Fatima, um, but that that's the origin of it, right? Full term, weaned, uh, went through the whole process of, uh, of, of being a baby. But of course, as we said in the name, case of Fatima, it's after the mother of Khadija. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says something very beautiful. He said that, uh, verily Allah has weaned Fatima and her offspring off from fire, from, from the fire of Jahannam from her birth. So Allah has weaned her and her children off of that, that she would not uh, touch it or, 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 uh, or drink from any of its punishment. So let's go through the children of the Prophet ﷺ right quick and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. First child is who? You guys are gonna make this halaqa so much longer. So if you know the answer, I suggest that you say it. Or if you think you're close, you say it. 
The first one is actually Qasim, right? Because I want you to get the full picture. Qasim was born around 12 years before prophethood, and he lived for about three years. So, you know, we know that the sons of the Prophet died right away, but Qasim actually lived about three years. So this was a very painful, it's their first child, and uh, died of some illness uh, in the hands of Khadija and, uh, and the Prophet Zainab, the oldest daughter of the Prophet was born about 599, a year after uh, Qasim. And then there is Ruqayya, who was born about two years after that, year 601. And then there's Umm Kulthum, who some scholars say is less than a year younger uh, than Ruqayya. So Umm Kulthum is immediate after Ruqayya. And then there is Fatima. And we said Fatima is born around the year 610 when the Prophet received revelation. And then there's Abdullah, who died at birth, okay, or, or very close to birth. And then there's the last son of the Prophet who was born, of course, in Medina, the only son not from Khadija, but from Maria, and his name was? Ibrahim, very good, okay? So those are the seven children of the Prophet So Khadija is the only child that actually grew up in Islam, okay? That was born and raised in Islam, whereas the others uh, were not. What's going on in the household of the Prophet at the time? Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum were both engaged when the Prophet received revelation. Does anyone know who they were engaged to? The children, the two sons of Abu Lahab. That becomes very difficult. The man who cursed the Prophet who stopped him and humiliated him in public, his uncle Abu Lahab, who humiliated him and then Ali radiallahu anhu rose to his defense, that young child, both of the Prophet ﷺ's daughters were engaged to Utbah and Utaybah, the children of Abu Lahab, Utbah and Utaybah. Engaged, now engagements at that time, of course, would take place very early on. They, these marriages were arranged very early on. So, uh, you know, Ruqayya was only about seven, Umm Kulthum was about six. When you say engaged, that just means that it's understood that when they come of age, they'll be married. Uh, they'll be married to these, uh, to these people. Um, Zainab was already married, and her husband's name, anyone know? Sira tests. Al As ibn Rabi'a. So Zainab, the oldest, is married to Al As ibn Rabi'a. Ruqayya is engaged to Utba ibn Abi Lahab. Uh, um Kulthum is engaged to Utayba ibn Abi Lahab. And you just have now Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. When Fatima was born, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and again, it could be the timing of it. I mean, that could have a lot to do with it. The Prophet ﷺ immediately looked at her in a different way, absolutely fell in love with this baby girl of his. And it's so much so that when Allah revealed, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Warn your closest relatives, call out to your closest relatives, and warn your closest relatives. The Prophet ﷺ stood up and he said, he only called two people by name. He said, يَا Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. Safiya was the mother of uh, uh, Az-Zubair, okay? Safiya is the mother of Az-Zubair, the aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she was very close. Ya Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, Ya Fatima bint Rasulillah, O Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salni ma shi'ti min mali, ask me anything that you want of my wealth, anything that you want of my property. La amliku lakum min Allahi shay'a. I cannot testify on your behalf or I, don't, I cannot do anything for you with God on the Day of Judgment. What that means is that you know how much I love you, my closest. And you know, Ibn Hajar says the fact that the Prophet ﷺ named those two was for a reason. Safiya was his favorite aunt, close to him. Well, Khala, and she, she, she's, she's a special aunt to the Prophet ﷺ. And Fatima was un, you know, this unbelievably beloved child to the Prophet So he's saying, even you two, and that's a message to everyone else, you have a responsibility before Allah that is an individual responsibility, and it is not something that can be bought with money. I can't protect you. You have to do your part and answer the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when the Prophet was even asked, when, when, if you remember the 40 hadith on, on social justice, and we talked about this, this narration, where there was a rich woman, a powerful woman that stole and they asked uh, Usama ibn Zayd to go talk to the Prophet ﷺ and see if he can let it go because she's, she's a very powerful woman and it's not right to punish someone who's so powerful. 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, even if Fatima was to steal, she would be punished. There's no favoritism here, because you know where Fatima is to me. The fact that I would even punish Fatima, I'm not going to let someone go because, or you know, uh, not hold someone accountable because they're from some powerful uh, class or because they belong to something uh, that, is, that, is, that is there. So there's some elements now that come into the household of the Prophet ﷺ later on. Fast forward to the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. The mother of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Khadija passed away, um, she was, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would be attacked because remember Khadija died around the same time, only three days apart according to some narrations from Abu Talib. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be viciously attacked in public at this point now. He had no physical protection on the outside. And when the Prophet ﷺ would come home covered in blood, which by the way, according to some of the scholars of Sirah, there were eight times that the Prophet ﷺ was publicly beaten. Eight times. So we know of Ta'if and we know, but eight times that something was thrown on him or he was punched or he was hit. So when the Prophet ﷺ is in public, he's fair game. When he comes home wounded, it's Fatima radiallahu anha that takes the role of playing the role that Khadija radiallahu anha used to play. She's the one that really steps in and that starts to, uh, to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Hassan radiallahu anhu says that Fatima uh, would be the one to clean the wounds of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how old was she? About 10 years old. Think about that burden. 10 year old girl walking up to her father Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, having to clean up his wounds and, and comfort him when Khadija radiallahu anha was missing. And everyone knew Fatima's closeness to the Prophet a 10 year old girl and at the age of 10 what was she nicknamed? Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father because of the hanan, the love and the compassion she would show to her father when she would see the Prophet struck, Ummu Abiha it's like she was another mother to the Prophet and one of the most painful narrations, the Prophet hated to see her in pain, absolutely hated to see her in pain because he knew this is a young girl that's been exposed. She didn't see the, the days of comfort and ease, which were really, you know, right before prophethood, where the Prophet ﷺ was at the max of his wealth, of his, of, his, uh, of, of his credibility in society. She didn't have that childhood. Her childhood was all oppression. Her childhood was witnessing her father rejected, beaten, her mother uh, becoming frail, dying due to the boycott. She witnessed all the hardship. And the most, one of the most painful narrations, and this was the peak of humiliation of the Prophet wasallam, was that because now he's fair game and they'd kick him in public, punch him in public, humiliate him, spit at him in public, Abu Jahl uh, challenged Uqba bin Abi Mu'it. Uqba bin Abi Mu'it, who was a powerful man in Mecca. And these are now the elites playing games with the Prophet wasallam at this point. Abu Talib's not here, we're not showing him any regard whatsoever. And the Prophet ﷺ has been rejected from Ta'if. He doesn't have anyone to protect him. Abu Jahl tells, he, 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 he challenges Uqba bin Abi Mu'it. He says, you really want to uh, humiliate him? He said, next time he comes to the Kaaba, because the Prophet ﷺ would still walk to the Kaaba and pray, even as they'd kick him, even as they'd spit on him. He'd still go and pray by himself. He doesn't have uh, Khadija radiallahu anha with him anymore. He says to Uqba bin Abi Mu'it, why don't you take the insides of a camel. Slaughter a camel and take all of its guts, all of its intestines, all of its nastiness, collect them, and the next time the Prophet ﷺ is praying in front of the Kaaba, go dump them on his back. This is just, you know, complete humiliation, right? Utter humiliation. So Uqba bin Abi Mu'it, of course, he says yes. And Uqba bin Abi Mu'it was a, was a huge man, size of Abu Jahl and Umar, big man. And so he collected all of that filth and they, they watched the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi waited for him to go into sajda, into prostration. And then he came and he dumped it all on the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And it was so heavy on the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that it caused his body to collapse. So it wasn't like just a filth, right? Complete humiliation. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he narrates this incident because Ibn Mas'ud was someone that was almost beaten to death already next to the Kaaba. We'll talk about him at some point. He was a small man, didn't have a tribe, didn't have any protection. So he goes to the house of the Prophet to, to, to let the household know what had happened. 
The only one he finds, 10-year-old girl Fatima anha, and tells Fatima that your father, you know, what, what, what's happening to her father, that your father has been crushed by these camel guts, he's being humiliated, everyone's laughing at him, mocking him. And Fatima radiallahu anha comes running out of her house to the haram, goes to the Prophet وسلم, crying so heavily and scratching the guts off of the back of the Prophet وسلم. Think of that scene, right? This is the daughter of the woman that held him when he received revelation. And think about how painful it was for the Prophet وسلم, right? This is, you never want to see your children see you like that, right? This is a next level of humiliation. So, and this is a long narration, the Prophet وسلم, this was one of the only times he actually prayed against his people, meaning he prayed against Abu Jahl, made dua against him. It, it's not often that the Prophet وسلم, makes dua against an oppressor. Almost always his prayers are for them. But he actually makes dua against Abu Jahl and Uqbah bin Abi Mu'it in that moment. He sees the pain of Fatima radiallahu anha. He comforts her and listen to what he says. He says, La tabki, don't cry. Inna Allah nasirun abaki. God will support your father. Allah will give victory to your father. Don't cry. Allah will give victory to your father. And it didn't calm her tears. So the Prophet وسلم, that's when he raised his hands and he prayed against Abu Jahl and Uqbah bin Abi Mu'it and those that had humiliated the Prophet وسلم, in front of uh, his father. Another narration uh, after Khadija had died, where the Prophet وسلم, sees uh, Fatima radiallahu anha again. This is a girl that's been through what no girl should have to go through, right? That deeply loves her father, witnessed that pain. And he says to her, Kayfa tajidina ki ya bunayyati? How are you, O oh my daughter? And she says, uh, Inni la waji'a, I'm in pain. Wa innahu la yazidu ma bi. Sudden, what's increasing my pain even is we don't even have food to eat. Right? The Prophet did not even have food. Right? He goes days and nights hungry. And she's saying, We don't have food, so I'm in emotional pain and I'm in physical pain. So the Prophet responds and he says, uh, Oh my daughter, Ala Tardin, Annaki Sayyida Tunisa al Alameen. He said, Oh my beautiful daughter, aren't you pleased that you are the master of all women? You are the leader of all women, the women of all the world. Look at the, uh, the, the knowledge, understanding, adab of this young girl, Fatima radiallahu anha. She says, Ya abati, fa'ayna Maryam abnata Imran. She said, oh my father, but then where is Mary, the mother of Jesus? What about Maryam? <laughs> How could I be the leader of the women of the world? What about Maryam? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, tilka sayyidatu nisa'i alimiha. فَعَلَى هَذَا مَرْيَمُ خَيْرُ نِسَاءِ الْأُمَّةِ الْمَاضِيَةِ وَخَدِيجَةُ خَيْرُ نِسَاءِ الْأُمَّةِ الْكَائِنَةِ He said that she was the leader of the women of her time. And in that sense, Maryam was the best woman of her times and Khadija was the best woman of her times. So there's a difference between Sayyida and Khayru. The best woman of all time is Maryam. And the best woman of her time is your mother Khadija. And Fatima radiallahu anha is one of those who perfected her faith. So two, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned four women who perfected their faith, had perfect faith, and that was Maryam, Asiya, Khadija, Fatima. So Fatima and her mother, imagine, two women, women that had perfect um, iman, right? That had perfect uh, faith. And some of the scholars, they, they said, why Fatima? Why does she have perfect faith and not the other daughters of the Prophet ﷺ? They were surely beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. But why Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha? And some of the scholars, they, they said, number one, this is a gift from Allah that Allah gives to people, right? This is Fatima would exert herself in worship and you'll see her in her lifetime. She resembles the Prophet ﷺ more than any other human being. We'll talk about that. No one resembles the Prophet like Fatima. She was a copy of the Prophet ﷺ, and that translated also into her nobility, her worship. Some of them said because she was born into the days of hardship, and as opposed to her sister, she, she grew up watching her father tortured, and she was the one playing the role of Khadija, supporting the Prophet ﷺ. She spent her, her uh, three years of her childhood in the boycott. She never saw the days of wealth like the other children of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, she made the hijrah with her father. So she actually migrated with the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. 
at the age of uh, 13 years old. And uh, she, she migrated with her sister, Umm Kulthum, the Prophet Sallallahu Sauda bint Zama'a, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and Aisha's mother, Umm Rumman, which is the wife of Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with them all. So they all migrated to Medina together. So Fatima is attached to the Prophet Sallallahu throughout his most difficult days. She is a woman who perfects her faith. Uh, I mentioned the qualities, the names. Does anyone remember from Khutbah what were her other two names? Fatima Al is coming. Some of you are going, say it. It's okay, Zahra, which means the radiant face. She had a radiant face like her father. Fatima radiallahu anha, when you looked at her face, it was just full of, of nur, full of light. Just like the face of the Prophet And also, there's one more. Al-Batul. Someone was listening to my khutbah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Al-Batul. All right? Which means the one who's turned back to Allah, speaks to her worship, turned back to God. So speaks to her worship, speaks to her zuhud, her asceticism, and her, and her, uh, and her sharaf, her nobility. So anyway, they get to Medina, and now we start to see how does Ali and how did the Ali and Fatima story happen. By the time they migrated, Ali was too old to live in the house of the Prophet ﷺ at that point. Okay, because he, he'd become old enough to where he was of age, and so he was separated from Fatima, even though he grew up with Fatima, and he was close to Fatima in age. So they grew up together. But Ali radiallahu anhu had moved on. And that's why when they got to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ paired him off with Sahl ibn Hunayf as, as a brother. And uh, the home of Kulthum ibn al-Hadim, a man by the name of Kulthum ibn al-Hadim, that's where all the young single guys stayed in Quba. So when they made hijrah, all the young singles went to the house of Kulthum ibn al-Hadim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So when the Prophet ﷺ got to Medina at that point, again, Ali radiallahu anhu is grown. He lives outside of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. As for Fatima radiallahu anha, she still lives in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi So when they're building the house in Medina, she's there. She's right there with the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what was the love of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like for Fatima? It was to a point that it used to make the others in the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a little jealous. Okay, and Ali radiallahu anhu was one of them. Uh, Usam ibn Zaid radiallahu anhu he says that one day I was sitting. So this is now before Ali marries Fatima. We were in, uh, we're, we're in Medina, and Ali and Al-Abbas sought permission, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Ali sought permission to enter. So they came in, and um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Usama, do you know why they're coming at this time? They said, no, he said, no. So they came in, and they sat, and they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we've come to you to ask you, who is the most beloved of your family to you? We were having a, a debate. <laughs> trying to figure out who do you love most uh, from your family. Now there's a similar narration where Amr ibn al-As asked the Prophet Man ahabbu nasi ilayk, who's the most beloved of people to you? And he said Aisha, his wife. And then he said Abu Bakr, Abuha, right? And then Umar. Here it's like very specific, like from the family. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, um, Ahabbu ahli ilayya Fatima. He said, the most beloved of my family to me is Fatima my daughter. It was really interesting because in the other narration when he responded to Amr, Amr said, no, 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 I mean from the men. Like it was weird for you to say that you loved your wife and you loved your daughter that much, right? So they had a similar understanding. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we're not talking about that. We're talking about from the men. <laughs> we get you love your daughter, Fatima. There's no, there's no comparison to her. And in this narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees Usama ibn Zayd um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ahabu ahli ilayya. مَنْ قَدْ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْهِ Usama ibn Zayd. He said, well, the most beloved of, of, of the young men in my family are the one who, is the one who Allah favored and I have favored, Usama ibn Zayd, who was the son of the adopted son of the Prophet wasallam. Who was Usama's mother? Let's see if someone can catch it. We talked about her. Um Ayman. Good. So Usama ibn Zayd. So the Prophet wasallam was talking about Usama ibn Zayd. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, ثم Ali ibn Abi Talib, then he said an Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Al-Abbas said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you made your uncle the last of them? 
And you talked about Fatima, and then Usama, and then Ali, and then you left me out. I'm your uncle. So the Prophet وسلم, said, لِأَنَّ عَلِي قَدْ سَبَقَ قَبِلْ He said, Ali made hijrah before you. Ali migrated before you. It took Abbas some time to embrace Islam and to come. So the Prophet said that. What does this mean now? What are the implications? Here's some beautiful narrations about what this would look like in Medina. Thoban radiallahu anhu, he narrates, he said, when the Prophet وسلم, would leave Medina, the last person he would sit with is Fatima. And when he returned, the first person he would sit with was Fatima. Anytime the Prophet وسلم, left Medina, last person he's going to sit with is his daughter, Fatima. First person he's going to sit with when he comes back is his daughter, Fatima. Abu Tha'laba gets more specific. He says when the Prophet وسلم, used to go on a journey or a battle, the first thing the Prophet وسلم, would do was he'd go to the masjid, pray to rak'ahs, then he would go to the house of Fatima and he'd take his time. <laughs> so it's not like he'd just kind of go say, Salaamu Alaikum. This is after Fatima would move on, obviously, and get married. But it just shows you the love and the preference. And then he would visit his spouse, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So before he would even go to his azwaj, before he'd even go to his wives, he'd go to his daughter, Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha. The last person to see before traveling, the first person to see when he got back, even when she got married, that was the, the place of Fatima uh, anha. And what a father the Prophet is. You want a lesson in fatherhood, just like everything else, he sets the standard. Uh, here's what Aisha anha says about Fatima and the relationship with the Prophet She says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَشْبَهَ سَمْتًا وَلَا دَلًّا وَلَا هَدْيًا بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي قِيَامِهِ وَقُعُودِهِ مِنْ فَاطِمَةً بِنْتُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ She said, I've never seen a person who resembled the Prophet ﷺ in his look, in his walk, in his guidance, in his character, in everything that he did, even in his standing up and sitting down. The way the Prophet ﷺ would sit down and the way he'd stand up, Fatima looked exactly like him. She acted exactly like him. She was, she was a copy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Aisha says, وَكَانَتْ إِذَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ قَامَ إِلَيْهَا When she would enter into a room, no matter what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the middle of, he would stand up for her. فَقَبَّلَهَا And then he'd walk up to her and he'd kiss her on the forehead. And then he would hold her hand, فَأَجْلَسَهَا فِي مَجْلِسِهِ and the Prophet ﷺ would sit her down where he was sitting. <laughs> Look at this honor. And she says about Fatima radiallahu anha, she says, وَكَانَتْ إِذَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا And when the Prophet ﷺ would enter upon any gathering or any setting that she was in, she would rush. قَامَتْ مِنْ مَجْلِسِهَا She would stand up, she'd rush to the Prophet ﷺ. قَبَّلَتْهُ She'd kiss him on the forehead. She'd hold the Prophet ﷺ's hand. أَجْلَسَتْهُ فِي مَجْلِسِهَا She'd sit him down in the, in, 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 the, in the chair or where she was sitting. And she adds one thing, وَكَانَتْ تُقَبِّلُ, وَكَانَتْ تُقَبِّلُ يَدَيْهِ She would kiss both of his hands. <laughs> right? That's just a special relationship that everyone sees. You don't interfere with that relationship. <laughs> you, you admire it. You love it. And this was a society where people used to bury their daughters alive. You think about that, right? Where Allah talks about the, the way they treated their daughters that when they would get the news that they had a daughter or a girl, uh, uh, you would see their, their, face and their faces darkened. And this is in that society that the Prophet ﷺ is honoring his daughter that way. What a father, right? And you can't, I can't think of any father that does that for his daughter to that extent, right? And that's a lesson for all of us especially. SubhanAllah, you know, it's, it, part of that, part of that was certainly the loyalty of the Prophet The same way with Khadija that he has to honor her because Khadija did things for him that no one else did. Fatima did things for the Prophet that no one else did. And the Prophet honored that uh, to, to, to a great extent. So anyway, uh, Ali and Fatima uh, grew up together. Now let's get to the marriage. When does the marriage take place? The Battle of Badr just took place. They're in Medina. There was a great incident of sadness, of tragedy that happened on the day of Badr. Does anyone know what it was? Anybody? They called it the day of great joy and the day of great sadness. Because it was the victory of the Battle of Badr, but there was a day of great sadness too. The death of Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet Ruqayya got sick 
before Badr. And that's why Uthman ibn Affan did not go to the Battle of Badr. He stayed back and he took care of Ruqayya. He took permission from the Prophet ﷺ to take care of Ruqayya. And Ruqayya died on the same day that Badr was won. So while the Sahaba are celebrating and this was a great victory from Allah, the news comes that the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ has died and that Ruqayya uh, and, and that Uthman radiallahu anhu was in great sadness. And they were sad both for the Prophet ﷺ and for Uthman, because Uthman was a very special and beloved person. What did the Prophet ﷺ do after the death of Ruqayya? Uh, Uthman anhu, the Nurain, the possessor of two lights, married Umm Kulthum anha, the next daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. So at this point now, Zainab is still in Mecca. She's with Al-As ibn Rabi'ah. Ruqayya was married to Uthman, actually went to Abyssinia with Uthman, passed away. Umm Kulthum has moved out from the house and lives with, uh, with, with, with her husband Uthman anhu. So Fatima is the last one in the household of the Prophet Now, can you imagine if, if you love the Prophet right? And you saw how much he loves this girl and she is the female version of him. <laughs> can you imagine how many people wanted to marry Fatima anha? So at the top of that list, Abu Bakr and Umar both proposed for the hand of Fatima, right? Both of them came to the Prophet ﷺ, first Abu Bakr and then Umar, and they asked for her hand. The Prophet ﷺ said, Intadir biha al He said, just wait, give me some time. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, she's young, meaning he had someone else in mind. When the Prophet ﷺ turns away Abu Bakr and Umar, something's up. <laughs> That means he has someone else in mind for her, right? Because you're not going to turn away Abu Bakr and Umar unless there's something special planned. And of course, Abu Bakr and Umar are closer to the age of the Prophet ﷺ. So there's someone else that the Prophet ﷺ has his eye on. So uh, how do we get Ali into the picture? One of the coolest things about this long narration is narrated by Al-Hasan. So it's how I met your mother, narrating from Ali, Fatima, how my parents met or how they got married, right? So Ali radiallahu anhu says that I thought about it, <laughs> but I was like, he turned away Abu Bakr and Umar? No way I have a chance, right? So whoever he's got his eye on, it's not me, right? Ali radiallahu anhu thought there is no way the Prophet ﷺ was thinking about uh, me. So the year is, this is right after Badr actually, it's the year 622 or 623. Ali radiallahu anhu, they're still young. Ali is about 23, Fatima is about 16 years old. They're still pretty young. Now marriage age was much younger than 16. People would get married 10, 11, 12, 13 at that time, right? So children are diff were different at the time, right? So Ali radiallahu anhu, he tells this narration, he says that I was sitting in the household of someone from the family, so it was like his aunt or an uncle, one of the, the Hashemites, and he said that uh, the family started to talk to Ali, he said, why don't you go ask for the hand of Fatima? And he said, particularly, there was a, an old female servant in the household. We don't know her name from the narration, but you can kind of get the picture. She said to, the, to Ali radiallahu anhu, you know, I think the Prophet sallallahu has his eye on you. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, بعد أبي بكر وعمر Think, you think he's going to marry his daughter to me if he turned away Abu Bakr and Umar? No way. So he said, she kept on pushing me. Until finally I said to her, وَهَلْ عِنْدِي شَيْءٍ أَتَزَوَّجُ بِهِ You think I have anything to get married with? I don't own anything. I'm poor. Remember we talked about the poverty of Ali. So even if I went to the Prophet I don't even have enough for a mahar, for a dowry, for a gift, for a wedding. I can't afford anything. How am I going to go to the Prophet She said, listen. If you go to the Prophet he'll, he'll marry his daughter to you. So maybe she had a hint or whatever it is, but she said he will do it. And then Ali radiallahu anhu says, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, Sa'ad, one of the chiefs in Medina, they all encouraged me to go ask for a hand. So meaning either the Prophet confided in Abu Bakr and Umar that he is the one, or they just had a feeling like he's, he's probably got his eye on you, right? So after, all of these people tell him to go to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, finally, I gathered the courage to go to him to ask for a hand. So he said, I got to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, feeling confident I can do this. Imagine the pep talks to himself. 
He says, I sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, I completely went silent. I could not say a word. And he says, Jalalatan wa haybatan ila Rasulillah. Just out of the glory and, and the respect, the love of the Prophet ﷺ. I couldn't say a word. So he says, I sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ and I stuttered a few times, mumbled a few words. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ was looking at me. So after some time, the Prophet ﷺ says, what brought you to me, O son of my uncle? And Ali radiallahu anhu, who was so eloquent, one of the most eloquent men amongst the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I tried to say a few words and I made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> and I was shaking, sweating, nervous, shivering. The Prophet ﷺ said, Alaka bihaja, do you have, do you need something? Are you okay? And he said that I still couldn't say anything. So he said, finally, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he smiled at me and he said, Maybe you came to ask for Fatima's hand? <laughs> he knows why he's there, right? So he, I'm going to make it easy for you. Fatima? He said, Maybe you came to ask for Fatima's hand in marriage. So he said, I put my head down and I said, Naam, Ya Rasulullah, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, okay, good. Do you have anything to, you have a gift? You have a mahar? Laka bi mahar? Ali radiallahu anhu said, I actually don't have a mahar. I don't have anything to get married with. So the Prophet ﷺ pointed to his dirah, pointed to a shield. He said, you've got that, right? He said, yeah. The Prophet ﷺ said, how much is it worth? He said, about four dirhams. It is nothing, right? Four silver coins, four dirhams. The Prophet ﷺ said, go sell it and come back to me and bring that as a mahar. It's good enough for a gift, subhanAllah. Now you see Fatima and then you see a whole community that is absolutely ecstatic to see this marriage of these two people that are so beloved to the Prophet So the Prophet then went to Fatima, Ali radiallahu anhu, easiest proposal ever, right? Hardest and easiest ever, right? He, said, he only had to say a total of like four words, walks out and he got it. Right? He was the one that the Prophet ﷺ had his eye on for Fatima. So he goes out. Now the Prophet ﷺ has to go to Fatima and ask Fatima if she wants to marry Ali. Fatima radiallahu anha wanted to marry Ali. But to have your father come and ask you at that, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ coming to her and asking her, uh, saying, uh, you know, Ali radiallahu anhu came and asked for your hand. Um, are you okay with it? Right? Fatima radiallahu anha turned red completely overtaken by haya, by modesty, she couldn't say a word. The Prophet ﷺ is dealing with two people that are not speaking and formulating this marriage, putting it all together, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he, he made sure, and this is where the fiqhi ruling actually, that in marriage, you know, because the woman has to consent, right? That's one of the rulings, right? But if, if you ask her, and you're very explicit, and she doesn't want to actually say yes, but she kind of indicates or she state, then that can uh, suffice as her approval for the marriage, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, do you have any objection? And she couldn't say anything. So the Prophet ﷺ took that, affirmed that her quietness was not because of rejection. He knows his daughter, but because of her modesty, her haya, she just didn't want to come out and say yes, right? So, and there's a very funny uh, narration. Um, while they were discussing arrangements, so now the Prophet ﷺ got Ali radiallahu anhu, he got Fatima, and um, this is where the, the, the uh, I'm going to shatter your image of the Sahaba, physical image of the Sahaba a little bit, all right? So the Prophet ﷺ was talking to Fatima radiallahu anha about the marriage and Ali radiallahu anhu was known to have a big stomach. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> big man, right? Ali radiallahu anhu's biceps were cons the biggest biceps amongst the Sahaba. They said that if you put two hands around the bicep of Ali, you couldn't close your hands. But he also had a stomach. And uh, Fatima radiallahu anha joked with the Prophet sallallahu She says, "Zawajtani li azim al -batan. You married me to the man with the big stomach, All right? So the Prophet sallallahu laughed and he said, "Innahu la awwalu ashabi salaman wa aktharuhum ilman wa aadhamuhum hilman." Beautiful description. Prophet sallallahu said he was the first of my companions to embrace Islam. The most of them in knowledge, aktharuhum ilman wa aadhamuhum hilman, and he has great patience. Hilm is, is forbearance, the way you treat people, right? Patience with people. So Prophet ﷺ once took it as, an, even though it was a joke, he took it as an opportunity to, uh, to praise him. 
and to speak about his, uh, his, his character. So anyway, Ali radiallahu anhu says, I went to the marketplace and I'm selling my dirah. The only thing I own is my shield and I'm selling my dirah. He says, so Uthman radiallahu anhu saw me in the marketplace for sale on my shield that I'm selling my dirah. Uthman is about to be his brother-in-law, right? Uthman is married to Ruqayya and then Umm Kuthum. So he says, Uthman radiallahu anhu came to me and said, how much are you selling it for? He said, how much would you pay for it? Now he told the Prophet it was only worth four dirhams. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, I'll give you 400 for it. He's trying to make things a little easier for him, right? So Ali radiallahu anhu said, sure, this is great, right? Uthman's trying to be charitable, but hey, you like it, you value it. Uthman is a rich man radiallahu anhu. He's the opposite of Ali in terms of his financial circumstances. I'll give you 400 for it. So he gave him 400 and uh, Ali radiallahu anhu said, so I gave him the dirah. And then after he gave me the 400 dirhams, he handed the shield to me and he said, this is my wedding gift to you. <laughs> so he got his 400 dirhams from the marketplace and he kept his shield. So he said, I went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I told him what happened. So he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam da'a li Uthman. It's one of the many occasions where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made du'a for Uthman. And he said, Rahim Allahu Aba Amru. May Allah be pleased with Aba Amru referring to him. And he said, he's the most generous of son-in-laws. Praising again the generosity of Uthman radiallahu. This was Uthman, big heart, always the first, right, to, to spend and to when the Prophet when he knows even that the Prophet would love to see that charity. This is Uthman radiallahu anhu al Ghani, uses his wealth, makes it easy for Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then comes the wedding preparation. Ali radiallahu anhu said, I sold some other things, just whatever I could find, completely emptied out my house. He said I had 480 dirhams. Okay, and so the Prophet some said, so what's the mahar going to be? He said 480 dirhams. I want you to take a moment and think about this. The mahar of the queen of Jannah, the leader of the women in paradise, is 480 dirhams. Some people have abused this concept so much, turned it into a price, a value. It's supposed to be a gift to symbolize a union. It's supposed to set the tone for ihsan, for excellence, the gift giving of the husband to the wife, and some people have abused this concept so much, turned it into like an insurance plan or something like that, right? Like 20,000, that's like, where did this 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, where does this come from, right? It's not, the spirit of it is there. Now the Prophet ﷺ did not limit, he didn't top it off, but the Prophet ﷺ said the best of mahar and the best of weddings are the ones that are the least expensive, right? There is khayr, there is barakah, there's something beautiful and blessed about a simple wedding, a simple mahar. Don't overdo it. You know, that money that you're spending to, 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 to uh, show, show, every, show everyone who you are and what you are, that money will die the same night. It will go to waste and it might even be sinful. It might even be israf. It might even be an extravagance. And then you could have used that money for something so much better, right? So the Prophet in his own example, and that's why in, in the Hanafi uh, school, many of the Ahnaf became their history, right? Al-Mahar al fatimiyah right? The, the, the Mahar al-Fatima is the Mahar at the time of marriage, right? Just the gift, the dowry at the time um, of marriage. So this is the, the leader of the women in paradise. Sayyida to Nisa al-Jannah, 480 silver coins, a few dirhams. Ali radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu he said, what should I do with it, you know? So it's not just that, the Prophet sallallahu said, اِجْعَلْ ثُلُثَيْنِ فِي الطِّيبِ وَثُلُثًا فِي الْمَتَاعِ He said, use two-thirds of it to buy her some perfume and use one-third of it to buy some furniture. Take the 480 and get, get, get it ready. Go get her some perfume, go get her some furniture for her house. So Ali radiallahu anhu, this is where the community starts to come together now. He said, so I had no idea how to buy perfume. Never bought perfume in his life. He said, so Bilal radiallahu anhu went with him and Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu helped him buy some perfume for his wife, Fatima radiallahu anha. And he said, and I gave the rest to Umm Salama radiallahu anha. We're bringing in now some heavyweights, right? Some senior Sahaba. This is the excitement of the community. And I asked Umm Salama to use whatever was left to buy what was necessary for the bride for her preparation. The Prophet sallam, then gave some money to Abu Bakr. And he said to Abu Bakr to uh, buy some clothes for Ali and Fatima. And then he sent Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he said, make the preparations for the wedding. So 
when they went out to the marketplace, now you got Abu Bakr and Ammar ibn Yasir going out shopping for their wedding. Ammar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I would show everything to Abu Bakr for approval. He would approve it. We'd buy it. We came back to the Prophet ﷺ, brought the stuff. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for barakah, for blessing in the few items that we bought. Masruq radiallahu anhu says that Aisha and Umm Salama um, were given the responsibility to prepare the home of Ali and Fatima. So look at how simple these people are. Aisha and Umm Salama took some mud from the valley, they prepared it, they cleaned it, and they turned it into, they said, we made it into cushions with our hands. Put a simple cloth over it and we made it into cushions from our hands. They took some dates and some uh, water. They placed a wood in the, you know, I hope that one day we can actually create these simulations uh, to show people this. I know there have been some attempts, but it would just be beautiful to see it. They put a wood in the corner where they could hang their clothes and they, could, uh, they also had some hooks on the wood so that you could hang some of your water vessels. And then the story of this, this marriage becomes Kitabun Nikah Babul Walima in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. Uh, Babul Walima actually starts off with this. The Prophet ﷺ himself made the bed. How do you make a bed? The Prophet ﷺ with his own hands, he took palm leaves, uh, he took wood, he stuffed the wood with some of the palm leaves, and then the Prophet ﷺ took a velvet cover, took a pillow, uh, that was made of animal skin, filled it with some of the palm fiber as well, that was their cushioning on the inside. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, left for them a pot, and he left for them a water skin, and he left them, for them a couple of stones that they could grind grain with. This is the making of the house of Ali and Fatima. Ali radiallahu anhu narrates, he said, we had one bed in our house, and he said it was everything for us. He says it was our bed at night, it was our couch during the daytime, and he said, and we would feed our animals off of it. And he said, we never had a servant. We never had a jariya in our home, which is a story that we'll talk about next week, inshallah, as we, as we continue. So this is, subhanAllah, the simplicity of that coming together. Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha said, the best wedding I ever saw, the best walima I ever saw was the walima of Ali and Fatima. All they had was some barley, some dates, and some hais. Hais is date paste, some hais. Uh, which they eat in the desert. And that was the wedding meal of Ali and Fatima. And it was the happiest day that they remembered in Medina. SubhanAllah, seeing that wedding, the, the joy of the Prophet Sallallahu the simplicity of this wedding, that's setting the tone for everybody to how they approach these celebrations and how they approach their weddings. Uh, finally, the Prophet Sallallahu sent Anas radiallahu anhu, he called Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, wa ba'dul Ansar and some of the Ansar they bore witness to the wedding and the Prophet ﷺ says, Ushidukum anni qad zawajtu Fatima min Ali ala arba'a mi'ati mithqal min fiddah. The Prophet ﷺ said, I bear witness, or you bear witness in front of you that I have married my daughter Fatima to Ali uh, for 400 uh, small silver uh, coins, for the 400 dirhams. The first night, these two people who couldn't even talk <laughs> to express their desire to marry one another, that was a hard wedding day. So the Prophet ﷺ told Ali radiallahu anhu at the walima, he said, go home. And he said, before you're, before you're intimate with each other, he said, wait for me and I'll come to you. All right? So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that uh, I came home and he said, Um Ayman brought Fatima to the house. So the Prophet ﷺ sent Ali to the new house, the bed. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha went home with Umm Ayman radiallahu anha. And he said, we sat there and we just waited for the Prophet ﷺ. Super nervous, I mean anxious, what's he gonna say? This is, it's hard, right? To be the daughter, the, father, the son-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ, to have him as your father-in-law. He said, so the Prophet ﷺ walked in. Um, and we were both sitting there and they were both shaking, nervous, uh, anxious. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't stand up. He told them to stay there. He took the water in their house, the water jug. This is so beautiful, SubhanAllah. He made wudu with the water. Prophet ﷺ, tawadda. Then he made wudu into the jug. So he told Ali radiallahu anhu to come. 
Ali radiallahu anhu came, the Prophet poured the water on him and made dua for him. Then he sent Ali radiallahu anhu to sit down. He told Fatima radiallahu anha to come. Fatima radiallahu anha was shivering from her haya when the Prophet called her. So the Prophet comforted her. He said to her, do not worry. He said, I've married you to the most beloved person in my family. I'm marrying you to someone, don't worry, you're okay. I'm marrying you to someone special. I'm marrying you to Ali radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet made wudu and he poured water on Fatima radiallahu anha. He embraced her and listened to this beautiful dua and we'll end with this inshallah. What a father, subhanAllah. He said, Allahumma barik fihima. Oh Allah, bless them uh, fihima wa barik alayhima. Oh Allah, bless them. What in fihima is what is between them and upon them. Bless them in what is between them. And bless them in what is upon them. Wa barik fi shiblihima. And bless them in their offspring. So the Prophet ﷺ did his wudu. He wiped the water over, poured the water on her, made that dua for her, and Ali. And then the Prophet ﷺ walked out. And that was the way that this blessed union uh, came together. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make beloved to us the Prophet ﷺ and his family and his companions and to allow us to be like the Prophet ﷺ and his family and his companions, to allow us to not just love them, but to allow us to also manifest those beautiful, noble qualities that we speak of. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us with them all. Allahumma ameen.